Hi, I'm Megan. And I'm Sarah. We're two moms with eight kids between us from preschool to teen. This is the show where we help you feel better about the mom you are and share our own parenting tips and personal stories. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Happy New Year, everyone, and welcome to the Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers, and I'm so glad you're listening today. So this is episode number 21 in our Voices series, which is where Megan and I take a break from our usual chat with just the two of us, and instead we take turns doing an interview with someone we know you'll love hearing from. So today my guest is Sarah Bagley. Sarah is a writer, blogger, podcaster, fitness instructor, and a mom of three who lives outside Washington, D.C. And I have known Sarah online for several years now, and Megan and I have both had appearances on her show, the Sarah R. Bagley podcast, so you may have heard us uh, say her name before. Sarah is such a perfect guest for a January podcast episode because she's truly one of the most upbeat, motivated, and goal-oriented people I know without being obnoxious about it because she's totally real too. So you're going to hear us talk about everything from fitness to goal setting to personality types and balancing the reality of motherhood with that inner drive to do and be more. So I'm really excited for you to hear this interview. First up, though, we are welcoming back LinkedIn Learning as a sponsor of the podcast today. LinkedIn Learning is an online learning platform that allows you to develop personal and professional skills from home on your own time. So it's great if you want to make a move in your career or even if you just want to learn a new skill, like say you want to redesign your website or improve your communication skills or master Photoshop, you can learn how to do all that and more on LinkedIn Learning, which now includes all of lynda.com's courses, which is a very well-known and well-respected online learning platform you might have heard of. So I have my eye on a course called Holding Yourself Accountable, because who does not want more of that this time of year? It's taught by a professor from Duke's Business School, um, and I just love that I can kind of scan the transcript when I look at these courses to see the topics that I'm most interested in. I can skip around if I want. I can watch on my computer. I can pick up on mobile where I left off on the computer. So it's just so smart, um, and the app and the desktop version work so well seamlessly together. So LinkedIn Learning is available nationwide, which we love for Canadian and international listeners. And once you pay the monthly subscription price, there's not any upsells or hidden costs. It's sort of just like the library opens up to you and you have access to all this content to really learn anything you want to learn. So we do have a special deal for you. You can get a free 30-day trial with LinkedIn Learning by visiting linkedin.com slash mom. So it's linkedin.com slash mom, all lowercase, to get 30 days of a free trial. So whatever your goals are as we kick off the new year, I guarantee LinkedIn Learning will have some way for you to master a new skill or just find out more about what it is you want to do this year. So why not sign up for that 30-day trial? Okay, guys, I'm really excited for you to hear my chat with Sarah Bagley. So let's get right to it. Hey, Sarah Bagley. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey, Sarah Powers. How are you? I'm so great. I am so happy to have you on the show, our first interview of 2018. So welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Awesome. So our listeners heard me talk a little bit about you already, but I would love for you to just shed light on specifically the stage of motherhood you are in right now, because this is something that has brought you and me together a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, You have three kids, but you're a few years behind where I am. So tell everybody just the state of your family life right now, how old your kids are, um, and kind of where that puts you in the trajectory of raising this family. Sure. Um, I was just thinking as you were saying that, that I feel like I'm straddling a lot of motherhood fences, and Mm. it's getting kind of uncomfortable. (laughs) I have a mental image of that now. I'm ready not to be in that place, but where I'm at, I have a seven and a half year old daughter. So she's in second grade at the local elementary school. And I have a four year, four and a half year old son who is in preschool and his preschool is just half day. Okay. Uh, every, every day though. Okay. Every day. <laughs> All the days. And, then, and my uh, two year old, uh, two and a half year old toddler is um, what we refer to as a stay at home toddler. So <laughs> he's um, with me or his grandma or his grandpa. Um, He's kind of passed off between the three of us um, as I need help. So I find it really tough to be in this stage because I'm trying to deal with elementary school. Yes. And I really am like, I don't, this is really irritating. And I'm trying to deal with the preschool. And then I have my stay at home tag along toddler. Yeah. 
No, it is it is a really challenging phase. Um, you know Leslie Miller, I believe, from Coffee and Crumbs, yes. or at least know we're all connected in the podcasting world. And Leslie's been on this show, and she and I have talked about the same thing. Um, because she is also just a few years behind where I am right now, and it's one in elementary, one in preschool, and one at home. And I'm sure we all have challenging phases ahead of us. I know that I'm I certainly do. I mean, at one point, I'm sure I'll have high school, middle school and elementary school. I mean, it, we're, it's going to happen throughout the time. But I do feel like where you are is really challenging. It's challenging for that third kid. You're in new waters with the elementary school one. Oh, so, yeah, word. I'm mm-hmm. yeah, I'm empathizing. It's so tough because I'm like, what is this? Like, Kate will bring home all this stuff. And like by the time I turn around, my boys have turned her homework, like flushed right. it down the toilet. Like yes. legitimately, this is what's happening. Yes. I had to tell her teacher, I said, I have two other kids at home. Yeah. She was not sympathetic. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah. I gave myself a pretty hard pass on a lot of elementary school stuff um, when my daughter was like in kinder and first. And then by the time I had a couple in elementary school, then it felt like at least the balance had tipped to where two of the three were in the same school. But um, OK, I think that's really helpful for our listeners. Ooh. As you know, a lot of our listeners have really little ones, even mm-hmm. maybe if behind you a little bit where they have babies and toddlers. And so I just think it's kind of helpful to hear hear where everybody is. And we're going to talk a lot today about the different hats that you wear in the work that you do. And I think the stage of life that you're in, uh, you know, informs that it's the backdrop to all of that. Um, for sure. So we are recording this in January. This will be our first um, interview episode of the year. And as I was thinking about this, you are pretty much my ideal podcast guest for the new year, because I feel like as I've gotten to know you, you embody everything about New Year's for me. And and I think I mean that as a compliment. Um, I think that you are incredibly ambitious and motivated and we're going to talk about that and you love talking about setting goals and achieving them you also are in the fitness world so like you kind of you have this you cover all the bases of everything that um so many of us aspire to at the beginning of a new year a fresh start you love to talk about you know creative inspiration so I just feel like you are I I want you to have like a sash like a you know like Miss America but like you are like the new the mascot of New Year's enthusiasm in all the best possible ways. So I love it. I'll I'm happy. It. I love it. I'm happy about that. But I wanted to start with one kind of little corner of that. And that mm-hmm. is your fitness, um, mm-hmm. your role as a fitness instructor, because of course, people know that you're a writer and a podcaster. And we're going to talk about that, too. But um, tell me how you got into teaching group fitness and kind of why that's a fit for your um, how that fits into the rest of the work that you do, because in a way, it seems a little different. You're this creative content creator, and then you also teach group fitness. So I'm dying to know more. Absolutely. So I love teaching group fitness and I never would have thought that if you asked me that 10 years ago. So I've always been active and I played on sports teams and I like that community part of it. And then when sports teams were no longer part of my life, I just kind of went to the gym and it was boring. I'm on the treadmill. It was dull. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then when I graduated from college and, you know, Dan and I, my husband, Dan, is my high school, no, my college sweetheart. Okay. So we got married and we moved back here to home, which is outside Washington, D.C. Okay. And I joined my first gym. And then I noticed people were going to these classes. I'm like, well, what is that? Then I got really into classes and I still didn't think I wanted to teach it, but I loved it because I didn't have to think about what I was going to do. They were going to tell me. Mm-hmm. And it was really fun. And I loved the people in the class. Mm-hmm. We got to be super good friends. And, um, we moved and I went to a different gym and at the new gym, I met my friend Kim, who I've known that CK is going to be eight. And I was just before I was pregnant with Kate. So almost eight years, okay. I've known Kim and she was teaching the group fitness classes at the time. And when we got to be really good friends, um, she's actually my podcast co-host on another show I do. Okay. And I said to her one day, I said, I think I really want to teach body step. So she became my mentor in the group fitness world. And I went to the body step training. And Body Step is part of the Les Mills kind of uh, machine. Les okay. Mills out of, is out of New Zealand. Okay. And they create a whole bunch of group fitness programs, Body Step, Body Pump, RPM, Grit, Body Flow, you name it, they have okay. a class for it. And I went to the Body Step training. Kate was, um, she was probably a year and a half years old. And I fell in love. I loved um, bringing exercise to people in a way that they could enjoy it Mm -hmm. because so many people hate the gym like I can't go a day without someone saying 
oh, I hate the gym. I hate the gym. I hate exercise. And it makes me so sad because I think it's not that you hate exercise. You just don't, you haven't found what you like yet. Right. So I fell in love with body step training uh, and I started teaching right away. And I, this is, I used to hide in the bathroom until it was time to teach because I was so nervous. I was so nervous to teach. I mean, I would be sweating before we even started. My hands would be super clammy. I'd be afraid to speak into the microphone. Um, but after I started doing it for a while, I just, it just, it, it's tr- truly the essence of who I am when That's I get up there and teach body step. So I loved it so much that I went from teaching body step to teaching body pump, which is like a weightlifting class. Okay to RPM, which is indoor cycling. Okay. And then I got my 200 hour yoga certification. That's separate wow. from Les Mills. Right. And I got a bar above certification. I just got a boot camp certification. And in a few weeks, I'm going to get a kid yoga certification. Oh, that's awesome. That's really so awesome. I love okay. the community feel of it, really. Okay. So what do you say to someone like me who, because I'm so curious about this, I um, am like an gym introvert. So when mm-hmm. I go to the gym, now I 100% acknowledge what you just said about having someone else tell you what to do with your workout, um, because that's definitely the best way to get a good workout. When I'm on the treadmill, I can't push myself really. And you're right, it is boring and dull. Mm-hmm. But I also kind of fight this urge to like be left alone when, especially when you've had three small kids and now I finally they're in school and I drop them off. And so my gym has amazing group fitness. Like people join my gym for the group fitness. Mm -hmm. And I, Sarah, I am like, it's not that I'm afraid in like a self-conscious way. Like I'd probably just go in the back and I would do my own thing. It's not that it's more that like, uh, it's like, I think it's the introvert tendency. It's like, I really don't, I don't want to get in there and not like it and then feel compelled to leave. I don't really want to talk to anyone. Do you feel like you have students like that? Cause I know you're outgoing and you're, oh, yeah. I, I'm sure that drew, drew you to teaching, but, um, sell me on group fitness for someone like me. Okay. Well, that's really funny because Kim is set my cook podcast co-host. Mm-hmm. Who's my friend I met at the gym. She is such an introvert. And I'm not even actually an extreme introvert, but I'm on the I'm on the I side of the scale for sure. Yeah. But even Kim obviously loves group fitness and teaches group fitness. So here's what I would say is if you want to leave my class, go ahead. Yeah. Like we don't care. I am so used to people coming in, coming out, coming in, coming out, leaving early, coming late. I mean, I taught taught this morning. I had someone come halfway through. I don't care. That does not like people I feel like think that the teacher is thinking about you. Right. We are and for like for your safety. Yeah. Like I give correct cues and make sure no one's um, getting injured. But right. I know people have lives and maybe right. aren't sure about the class. Right. So go ahead. Come late. Leave early. Um, I would suggest that anyone give a class three times. Okay. Because you don't understand, especially a highly choreographed class like Les Mills. Okay. People come in and they're like, what is this? Right. And why does everybody seem to know it? Yes, that is a bit. That's a big like fear driver for sure. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, every, everyone seems to know what she's saying when she says um, like Jack, like yeah. squat Jack. Like, what does that mean? Why is everyone or single knee? I don't know what that means. But once you've seen it three times, you're like, oh, OK. Yeah. Um, and then the people in the group fitness class are so kind of like the nicest yeah. people. So no one's going to really try to bug you. But I've made so much camaraderie in my classes. Like at the end of my class, I make them high five somebody and tell someone their name, but they don't know. Nice. I want to come to your class. Is that convenient? I mean, we only live like 3,000 miles away. (laughs) And you know what that's done? It's created such a community that when people aren't there, we're like, hey, where were you? (laughs) Right. Yeah, no, I know that exists. And I know that can be really positive. Um, I think I, yeah, I just, I really like what you said about permission to just try it out, permission to come and go. And I am such a like rule follower that I think like, oh, I got to be there. And maybe coming from the dance world as well, where, you know, it's similar. You're in a studio, you're in class. But I think the etiquette is probably different in professional ballet. Like you are there 10 yeah, minutes right. early. You would never, ever walk out, you know, but I totally get what you're oh, saying. Yeah. We're, this is different. We're grown ups. like this is a different. Yeah. So I really like what you said, actually. I will report oh, back and, if I. <laughs> OK, good. And fine. OK, not every we're. We're going to attract some people and repel some people with our right. personalities. Kim and I teach a class there. It could be the same Les Mills format. We're not going to teach it the same. Right. Because she is going to be a drill sergeant and I'm going to be a cheerleader. Right. So find what works for you. I like a mix of, an, of motivating and encouraging um, while also being like, you know, if this is if this is not you today, pick an option. Right. I yeah. You, and I think that, an option. that that I can. 
I think can almost be intimidating as well because I go to a pretty big gym with a really amazing stacked um, schedule of classes and all that, mm-hmm. which is great. But then there, it's like, there's so many options and you know, my personality wants to like talk to everyone and find out exactly which one is the best one for me before going when really I should just walk in and give it a try and try yeah. another one. And yeah. then if you like that instructor, ask her what else she teaches. Mm-hmm. Cause yeah. that's how it works. I mean, I have people that just follow me from class to class, but that's a bit, my personality works for them. Right. Right. I love that. Um, Well, let's kind of shift into talking about goal setting in general. And fitness is Mm -hmm. obviously a goal. I'm sure your classes are packed this time of year. Um, But maybe just give our listeners your your quick and dirty how you think about goal setting, whether it's fitness, writing, you know, personal life um, and, you know, where you are with goal setting either this year or just kind of your general philosophy. Yeah, sure. So my my philosophy has definitely changed since having three kids. Yeah. I have learned that I cannot control anything yeah. or any outcome. <laughs> and the more I try to tighten my grip on how I think things should look, yeah. the worse I am. Mm-hmm. So I am definitely a uh, type A. I'm, I'm very self-motivated. Uh, if ever, anyone listens to uh, Gretchen Rubin's podcast, Happier, mm-hmm. and knows her four tendencies, I'm an upholder. Um, my husband's been telling me I have an extreme personality type for my whole life. And I'm like, wow, you're right. (laughs) Uh, However, I have three young children. So I, there's just there, I can't just set out to do something and do it. It just doesn't work that way. Right. So this year, uh, in in past years, I've picked a word for the year to kind Mm -hmm. of guide me. And I've also picked a word this year and I picked a Sanskrit word, um, Santosha, which means complete acceptance, because that is something I rail against at every turn. Yeah. Say it again. Say the word again. So we. Santosha. S-A-N-T-O-S-H-A. Okay. Interesting. Complete acceptance. So that means I do have, um, and I almost hesitate to call them goals. I have like intentions Mm -hmm. because I don't want to get so wrapped up in a certain outcome because I have to be flexible because sometimes I start the year with a goal and then like a portion of the way through, I think I don't even like this anymore. Yeah. So I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. No, that's so interesting. I think there are people who really like the goal setting process, um, mm-hmm. but maybe are attracted to that. It's almost like the chase, right? Like the shiny mm-hmm. object right. and the new year is so tempting to get into all of that. Um, and so I think what I'm hearing you say is we it's it's really important to find the process or the thing that's going to keep us grounded 365 days and not just excited about the shiny object. Does that make sense? And I'm sure there's a balance in there somewhere, but I love your complete acceptance. And that doesn't mean abandoning ambition or abandoning goals, but um, maybe, especially for a personality like yours, maybe, you know, tempering that um, outcome focus with a process acceptance at the same time. Absolutely. So this year I divided them into personal, family, and professional. And some of them I made pretty concrete. And some of them I made loosey-goosey because I just wasn't 100% sure what I meant, my concept. And I'm actually going to use the entire month of January just to think on, is this what I want to do? I think we feel so much pressure to be like, it must be decided today on January 1. And oh no, it's not January 1. So this is all over. Yeah, I totally do that. I Yeah, that that actually like prevents me from doing any real meaningful year planning because I get super hung up on that. Um, January 1. Thing. Yeah. So January 1 is just the date. Yeah. So you can pick, I believe in fresh starts anytime you want one. Yeah. So, uh, so for our family, um, we need to find a sitter outside of our grandparents because they have lives too. <laughs> and Dan and I never seem to do anything or go anywhere because we don't have another sitter. Mm-hmm. So a concrete goal is to find another sitter, which I've already made some progress on. Okay. And we have a kind of a loosey goosey goal of more family fun. Mm-hmm. Because this is a challenge having a seven, almost eight year old, and almost five year old, and an almost three year old. Yeah. Is stuff for the three year old is not suitable for my eight year old. Right. And vice versa. So, therefore, we just don't do anything. Yep. I can <laughs> so, tell you that is going to get so much better in the next like year and a half to two years, honestly. I can't wait for that. Yeah. yeah. It's, we are in, Brian and I look at each other all the time. So, ours are nine and a half, seven and a half, and almost five. And we just look at each other and we're like, this is like, the best phase. And I don't want to like jinx the future phases because I know there's great stuff ahead, but like they all three 
can enjoy the same thing. And we're, we are pinching ourselves because it takes a long time to get there. It is. Yeah. Our family motto is survive till five. five. (laughs) And lean in is our other motto. (laughs) I love that. Survive till five. If that is true, Sarah, if that is true, then I have like two more weeks because my youngest is going to be five at the, yeah, later in January. (laughs) No, but I would say even, even two and a half to three and a half, like all, it just got Mm -hmm. from two and a half on from right where you are on, it got progressively easier so um, that's good to hear that's yeah. that's what I've heard so sorry I, de- I derailed your goal no, no, no. so hopefully we can have some more family fun where we do have a lot of family fun is at the pool yes if you follow me on Instagram I'm Sarah R. Bagley um, from the months of May till end of August you will see nothing but photos <laughs> of us at the pool I love it because we live there it's down the street and everybody's happy all my kids can swim they yeah you're around swim lessons and we and my um, daughter and my middle guy are on the swim team and we live at that pool because no one fights. I love it. I so, love it. But we could find it. We need to find it. We, that's only three months of the year. <laughs> so I need to find other family fun or More I need to move fun. to where you are and can swim you around. <laughs> yes, that is a huge benefit. Right now it's 10 degrees out. So. Oh my gosh. I can't even. I love that. Well, can we talk a little bit about ambition in general? Because there's yeah. a lot of ambition wrapped up in this goal setting time period that we find ourselves in. And you and I, as we've gotten to know each other over the last, you know, couple of years, you have shared that you are just a naturally really ambitious person. Um, And I know a lot of, I know a lot of driven people or people who are, you know, self-identified perfectionists or goal setters, but I like that you specifically use the word ambition. And what I think you mean by that, and you can jump in and correct me, is you have big ideas that you feel like you could set into action or could accomplish and you're and you come across at least as confident in that but you also have this reality of there's only 24 hours in the day you have three young Mm -hmm. children um, and Mm -hmm. being a mom and having a family life is important to you as well so it's a tension between um, ambition and reality in a way do you do you think this is like a constant struggle for you? Do you feel like this has evolved for you? Um, And do you feel it more this time of year or is it just kind of always there? Oh, Sarah. (laughs) Get ready. My my ambition rubs up against motherhood so hard about every minute of every day. That's why I picked Santosha for my word because it just rubs up for me all the time. I, I mean, I do so many things and I have so many dreams for myself. And at the same time, I want to be with my kids as often as possible. And those two worlds rub up against each other every minute of every day. So what does that look like for you? I mean, I know you have a book project you're working on mm-hmm. and that you have goals for your podcasts and your blog. Is it, um, does it happen in your, cause I'm a very cerebral person. So I, I can re- identify with the part that's like, Ooh, I have an idea. I'm going to write it down, make a list. Um, but I feel like for you, you really do have this drive to create and to do stuff. So does it almost feel like something's holding you back? And I don't mean that in a, oh, yeah. in a negative way because we are all appreciating motherhood. Um, right. But yeah, so tell me what that what that what that actually looks like and feels like on a daily basis. It it feels like I'm just giving chest compressions to my creativity, <laughs> wow. to keep the blood circulating. Wow. Yeah. While I deal with my children. Yeah. And I mean that in like you know the nicest way. Yeah, and I think those who know you know you are a devoted mom. Um, you are you spend time with your kids. You're invested in their lives. So. I certainly don't want, I think this is really important to talk about because Mm -hmm. I think women in particular can feel shameful about saying that they have ambitions or saying that they Mm -hmm. maybe don't love every single second of being home with their kids. So has it been helpful for you to, you know, find work outside the home to get in? I know you've had nannies at certain times that allow you to Mm -hmm. devote time to your work. Does that, does that help? And, you know, and sort of to, give yourself the gift of that time to work on those projects? It, it does. And it doesn't. So I feel like I could easily work so many hours a day, but I only have so many hours. And, and honestly, I'm only willing to give up um, control to other people with my kids for so long. Right. So I know that about myself. Like I do not want anyone else to go to swim team with them, but me. Okay. I am particular about that. I am choosing that I am not going to have someone take them to swim team or swim practice. I will. Right. I want to be involved in that. So that means I'm making a choice that since I'm doing that, 
And that means I'm not going to be able to record a podcast or write or work on my book. So I do feel that while I find motherhood sometimes boring, sometimes mm-hmm. overstimulating, sometimes understimulating, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and I crave my creative work, at the same time, I value being very involved in their life in certain aspects, and mm-hmm. I won't give up that piece. So that rubs against each other a lot. Yeah. So what is the, like, if you're serving as life coach to yourself, mm-hmm. what is, yeah. what, what helps with that tension? What really helps for me is just to lean into it. Mm-hmm. I mother while I work and work while I mother. Mm-hmm. And I stay mindful about what I'm doing and it recognizes, recognize the choices I'm making. And also like I used to hide behind the fact that I'm working and I'm with my kids and now I don't at all. Mm -hmm. I use that as a total badge of honor. Like I can do so many things while I'm mothering them. Like for instance, at the pool this summer, I'm waving to my daughter as she's in the school for swim team. I'm throwing food to my middle, my preschooler, like a zoo animal. (laughs) And my toddler is hitting me in the face with my car keys while I give someone a phone interview. Nice. And like, I will do this phone interview while I'm in my bathing suit, walking the pool deck while my toddler hits me in the face with my car keys. (laughs) And that's just my reality. And it is, and it is. The a, less I, yeah, go ahead. The, the more I fight it, the worse it is. Right. And the more I'm like, this is it. And I'm actually doing, I'm, and I'm not doing a bad job. I used to think like, oh, I'm doing a bad job all around. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm here present at the pool. I'm taking care of my other two. And I'm taking this important phone call. Yeah. And it, we all know it's just a season. Um, and I think if yeah. you, if you were to, ask yourself, would I be happy just mothering? And I don't mean just in a, in a sense that it's less valuable. I mean, focused, solely focused on being home with your kids, or would you be happier solely focused, you know, say away from your kids Mm -hmm. in a more traditional work? And if the answer is that neither of those would make you happy, then I think you've probably found what works, even if it looks from the outside, like it's chaos or feels from the inside, like it's mm-hmm. chaos. And like we said, it's, yeah, it yeah. is only a season. It is. And it's the best of both worlds and the worst of both. Worlds. Yeah. Holding those in my hands. Sometimes, honestly, I cry in my car in a parking lot because it can be the best and the worst of both worlds. And other days I think I am so lucky because I don't have to ask anybody for time off while I go to Thanksgiving lunch. I just right. Go. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I, yeah. I'm, I'm with you there. I'm totally with you. Um, So we are going to take a quick break for an advertiser, and then we're going to come back and talk more about this kind of season of motherhood and some of the other work you're doing. So we'll be right back. Hey guys, it's Megan, and I just want to tell you about our sponsor, Simple Contacts. I was so excited to find out about this service because I don't know about you, but sometimes I know my prescription hasn't changed for my contact lenses, and I just want new contacts, but I've run out of time on my prescription, and I have to go into the optometrist and get a new one, and I don't always have time for that. So this is really cool magic. It's a system where you go on and take a five-minute vision test from your phone or computer. Then they have a licensed doctor review the test, and if it turns out that your prescription's still good, you just get a renewed prescription and you can order your brand of lenses right there from the site simplecontacts.com they've got tons of brands and different options for you and great prices so it's just so easy Um, this is not a replacement for your periodic eye exam you still need to go in and get those tests done every so often but it's a really easy and fast way to renew your prescription when your vision to renew your prescription when your vision hasn't changed That is amazing. I love when technology kind of catches up with us and makes life so much more convenient, especially for busy moms. It's so great. So we've got a special deal for you guys. If you want $30 off your contact lenses, go to simplecontacts.com slash the mom hour and enter the code the mom hour at checkout. So again, $30 off your lenses, go to simplecontacts.com slash the mom hour and enter that promo code the mom hour at checkout. Okay, we are back with Sarah Bagley, um, and we left off talking about this crazy season that, Sarah, you are in, um, and working while mothering and doing it all at the same time. I'm curious, what about when you when you pictured yourself as a mom and you had three kids and you and I both talked about, you know, having three kids, especially if people, our peers around us, maybe just have one or two. But when you pictured this season, say five to 10 years ago, either before you had kids or when you just were very starting out in motherhood, what's different about this season that you're in now than you thought it would be? 
Well, I never thought I would be doing this kind of work at all. Okay. I always imagined I would be working a traditional job. Okay. And when I had children, they would go to daycare. Okay. That's what I really thought. I, I went, I thought I would be a government worker. That's what my parents were. That's what okay. I went to school for. And okay. I thought I'd be doing this very traditional work. That's so interesting. And was it apparent know, right away? Right? Was it apparent right away that that wasn't the path or did it take a while to get there? Well, I was, well, I think if I could redo my college career, I absolutely would, which <laughs> most people would probably also say. Uh, so when I had my first, I guess it was my second job out of school working for our big local government. I mean, this is a big local government. Its budget is larger than four states. So wow. it's a big government. I worked in the budget office and um, they don't really encourage creativity there in the budget office. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not really known for that type of work. And my personality just did not fit. And it took a little while for me to realize that my personality was not a good fit for this job. I was not even good at it. I was bored. And when Mm -hmm. I had Kate, it was my escape hatch. Yeah. Because I didn't want to do it anymore. And I had been blogging before I had her. Okay. So I thought, I'm going to leave this job and I'm going to make money blogging because she'll just sit in like a bouncy chair and I'll (laughs) do my work. (laughs) So spoiler alert, that is absolutely not what happened because Kate cried her entire first year of her life. Ugh. So uh, that is not what happened. And this that also would have no. been I did quit my job. This also would have been like 2009, 10, somewhere in 10, there. 10, OK, yeah. which also yeah. is kind of when like blogging had blown up. So there were a ton of uh, at least it seemed from the outside, very successful um, mom bloggers right. out there. I mean, I think that's right. probably when you and I discovered Megan and I a couple of years later, yeah. I was working for Megan. But it was probably the bubble was about to burst in the blogging business sense in that, like it was about to get really, really saturated. So not only was that probably um, sort of like an adorably naive idea you had, it was probably Mm -hmm. rough Mm -hmm. timing in the blogging world for those who were, you know, around at that time. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. So, so interesting. Um, Okay. Well, you mentioned, didn't work out. (laughs) No, you mentioned personality and your job being not a great fit for personality. I want to talk actually about personality types briefly, which was not originally where I was going to go with this, but I happened on your blog before we started chatting today. um, And you were writing your post about your word for the year, which remind me now, because I still don't know how to say it. The word for the year is (laughs) Santosha. Okay which means total acceptance, right? Complete acceptance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. And you mentioned both your Myers-Briggs and your Enneagram type. So let's just go there real quick. Again, I think this is fun this time of year. Everyone's feeling a little self, you know, Mm self-analytical, self-reflective. So tell me your types um, and just kind of how you identify with those or if you do, um, because I know I identify more with my Enneagram than my Myers-Briggs, but why don't you tell us both? Yeah, so I am a Myers-Briggs ENFJ and that is, I feel like very, it, that's a very good assessor. My personality, I'm very extroverted. I forget what the other things are. Judging, um, but I think that's like more yeah, about that's like, the... um, scheduling. Mm-hmm. Like and you want to have things nailed down. Yeah. And the N is intuition. And the, did you say mm-hmm. F is feeling F. as mm-hmm. opposed to perceiving? Yeah. yeah. I feel like that really does. Pers- um, so, and the Enneagram, I feel like I'm a three. Uh-huh. Which is not very flattering. <laughs> well, you know, if you read the Enneagrams, they are they can be flattering when you're at your best and your healthiest. And then as you go down and read like what happens when you're not in your best place, there none of them are flattering. Mm-hmm. So um I have to say I know the Enneagram a little better than I know all of the Myers Briggs types. And I, I do think you're I could have I could have told you that you're a three. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I think I think it's in all the best possible ways. I can totally see you as a three. Yes. So when I'm at my best, it's awesome. And when I'm at my worst, uh, when I'm not accepting things and I'm railing against um, my choices, it's the worst. Yeah. Interesting. So did you use kind of your knowledge of those personality types when you chose your word and when you thought about, you know, this coming year? Yes, because I will do when I when I get very frustrated with my inability to do my creative work because of the choices I've made in motherhood, mm-hmm. that's where bad things happen. That's where I, I engage in black and white thinking. Mm-hmm. That's where I am um, mean to people in my home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I am not a good mother. If my value is is being good to people, mm-hmm. I really value connecting pe- connecting with people, being good to people, serving other people and my family. 
And when I am at my worst, when I'm not accepting the things I have chosen, that's when I'm at my worst. Absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I want to pause real quick to say that for our listeners, I kind of assume people understand personality type stuff because I feel like people are so into it these days. But listeners, if you're not familiar, so the Myers-Briggs test you've probably heard of, um, I can link in the show notes at themomhour.com to Megan and my favorite uh, site for finding out your Myers-Briggs type. And then Enneagram is starting to get a little more well-known, but it's definitely not as out there as Myers-Briggs. And it's um, your, you take a personality test and you're given a number one through nine. Um, And the way the numbers are described, like I alluded to, um, is really cool because it's more about really what drives you internally. And it's not like it's not really good or bad. Um, And in fact, each number type, the way it's described, it can describe you, like we said, Sarah, at your healthiest. um, And then also kind of the pitfalls in that type as you know, when you're not in your best place, how that plays out. Um, And that is fascinating. I do feel like it's catching on. Um, I am a one. I think ones and threes overlap. I'm friends with a lot of ones. Yeah. And ones and threes, I think, overlap in a lot of ways. They both can tend toward perfectionism, but I think in different ways. Ones can be really obsessed with doing things right, whatever quote unquote right means to them. So hyper focus on efficiency. Um, Ones can get really irritated when other people aren't doing things the quote unquote right way, which is totally me. Um, Threes tend to be a little more focused on outward achievement, like, like Mm -hmm. we were talking about ambition and status and sort of Mm -hmm. climbing ladders. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be the traditional corporate ladder. It's whatever ladder you have decided is important to you. Whereas ones are a little bit more um, kind of like moralistically or internally driven (laughs) to do the right thing or be the right way. Does that make sense? But there's a lot, there are a lot of overlaps in between ones and threes. Um, And the whole Enneagram is fascinating. So I just, I wanted to say all that in case listeners aren't familiar, I will link up to a couple of um, fun things. If you want to go down that rabbit hole, find out what your Enneagram is. Megan is a two. Um, And actually Mm. our sister podcast in the Life Listen Network, Selfie, has been doing an episode by episode little deep dive into each of the types. And it's been fascinating. So um, I think it's so cool. It's really cool. And actually, I found out my Enneagram type a couple years ago and I kind of read up and then didn't really think much more about it. But lately, I have been wanting to kind of return to that and just and just like read up a little bit more and think about how that plays out for me. So, again, New Year is a good time to sort of apply all of this self-analysis to what you want, to, who you want to be in this year and beyond. So um, that was yeah. a little, a little digression, but um, I do think it's really interesting. Um, so with that discussion of personality, Sarah, you talked about um, being, building community and, you know, how important that is to you. And so that's a great transition to talking about um, some of the work you do, we haven't talked about, which I want to talk about your podcasts first. Um and and then also just your the creative communities you've started to build, the networking you've done, because this is just really for me, it's been really um, inspiring to watch from the outside. So why don't you first just tell us about your two podcasts and what they are about? And we'll start with that. Sure. So I have two shows, uh, the Sarah R. Bagley podcast. I started in 2013 and I interview all sorts of different people. I've interviewed uh, people who have had their own company. I've interviewed authors. I mean, just anybody about anything. It's kind of like the Oprah show. Like you don't know who's going to come on, but they're going to be, they're going to be interesting. Yeah. (laughs) They're going to be interesting. And the common theme in the show is dealing with feelings of worthiness, perfectionism, kind of these things that we talked about in the Enneagram, Mm -hmm. that kind of like personality traits. And, you know, how do you deal with challenges and how do you overcome those things? And what does living, you know, your best life mean to you? I'm really Mm -hmm. interested in that question because I'm very interested in what is living my best life. And I ask myself that a lot because, you know, my, my goals are really important to me. And I'm always assessing like, why, why am I doing this? Should I be doing this? I want to build a life that I'm really proud of and right. that I really love. So I'm super interested in other people's experiences and opinions on what they think living a bigger life means. So I love that. that's my first podcast. And Sarah, you've been on as has Megan. Yes. In fact, it was this time last year. So we have, we'll, we'll have to next January. Yes. One of us will have to be on one of our shows. It's a, yeah. it's an annual thing. Um, I will link up the two that um, Megan and I were on in our show notes and then everybody can find you just search the Sarah R. Bagley podcast. Um, and so then, yeah. So tell me about your other one. 
So my other one is called 25% friends and people get confused about that, but it means we're a hundred percent friends. We're only 25% alike. So on the Myers, on the Myers Briggs, I'm an ENFJ and Kim is an ISTJ. That's what I am. Yeah. I'm an ISTJ. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, and my husband, Dan is an INTJ. So he and Kim, the two of them, I'm like, you guys are so annoying. (laughs) (laughs) So when we all get together, I'm like, you are Kim. Like you guys are so similar. Anyway. So Kim and I have a really fun podcast. Similar to you, Megan, that we, we, it's just the two of us talking Mm -hmm. and we, could not be more different. Uh, I am, you know, married to a man and have three kids. And Kim is married to a, used to be married to a man, is now married to a woman and has no kids. She lives a completely different life than I do. But we are still super good friends. And we talk about health and wellness and group fitness. And we also talk about, uh, we just did an episode on the Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies Framework because she's a rebel and I'm an upholder. Okay which is the complete opposite personality. So we, we take on these host of topics and people really love the show because we're so different. Right. So what comes out of Kim's mouth is like totally opposite of what I'm going to say. And right. I've had to teach Kim that people think differently than her, which has been a newsflash <laughs> to her. <laughs> but uh, I think it's great because I'm always looking for people who are different than me. Yes. To challenge, you know, challenge what I think and challenge what I think is true and show me another perspective. So. And that probably ties right into your like natural community building. So how has podcasting felt like community building to you? Because right now I'm sitting on the floor of my seven-year-old's bedroom by myself talking into a mic. And yet I know, I mean, Megan and I know with this show that it's an incredibly powerful community building experience. So how, how has podcasting kind of fueled that for you? And maybe what else has it led to um, in the area of community building? Well, I actually have to say, that's what I've struggled with. Mm-hmm. So I don't have a good answer for that. Because okay. I've actually struggled to get people to communicate with me and tell me about the show. Interesting. So that's a, that's a challenge I face. And that I would really welcome more people. Some, somehow people are always finding my show and asking to be on my show. But I don't get a lot of listener community work mm-hmm. for my Sarah R. Bagley show. I do more with my 25% friends because a lot of the people who listen know us in real life. They know us from the gym. Well, and I, I wonder too, if an interview based show, um, and this is true, you know, in our life, listen network, we have a mix of interview based shows and then just co-hosted shows. And I do think there is probably a difference in the approachability of the hosts, because if it's you and I'm not, this is not like a right or wrong thing, but if it's you and somebody different every time, um, listeners have a different get to know you experience because they're really getting to know mostly your guest who changes every time. Um, whereas in a show like yours and Kim's, um, they are getting to know the two of you and probably you do feel more approachable okay well maybe yeah yeah. yeah. maybe I just more meant your yeah the the way you've built community in general even if it's not tied to podcasting well what I've done from there so that all that to say uh Kim and I did do a live podcast at Lululemon and that was so fun that went off like gangbusters Kim was more nervous about it than I was because she's my personality I like almost didn't I almost didn't make it through our live show I was that was Kim she says she's still there (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I'm like, let's do it again. She's no, I like, mean like many years from now. Yeah, like, no, no, like tomorrow. Yeah. Have Kim. Yeah. We're, we're the same. And, and you and Megan are the same. So we're, yeah. 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 So that was super. And that was a way to really make people the part of the, of the conversation, which was totally fun. And I did do my own uh, Sarah R. Bagley live podcast and that was really fun. So here's where the community part came in. I did my own live podcast at this local place called Jam and Java in Vienna, where they host like concerts and things like that. But I did my live podcast there. And a woman who came to my live podcast was a creator of Awesome Women Entrepreneurs of Arlington, which is kind of the next couple towns over from me. Okay. She approached me after the show and she said, I want to grow Awesome Women Entrepreneurs. Will you be the Vienna Tyson's chapter leader? Wow. Sure. So I became the Vienna Tyson's chapter leader of Awesome Women Entrepreneurs. So I feel like these, all these kind of things seem so disparate, but kind of one thing leads to another, yes. the work I put out there. And that, that's a message I want to send to people. Like things seem like you're writing a blog, you have a podcast and it seems like it's not going anywhere, but one thing will kind of lead to another. You just don't know how the dots will connect. Yes, I would, I would totally agree with that. And then I would even add that for personalities like mine that are a little less outgoing and like maybe a little more head down in the day to day details, it will, it still seems that those sort of kismet opportunities 
come about, even if you're not physically going out into the community and hosting events and all of that, because that's not everybody's personality type. Um, I'm curious what you'd say to like the mom of really little kids who maybe isn't driven by quite so much creative ambition and just wants to have a community and feel connected to other people, but isn't probably going to start a podcast or go out and host events? Like, how do you think some of what you've learned applies to, you know, any mom who who really just wants to feel purposeful and connected and inspired? Um, do you have any words of wisdom, words of advice? Absolutely. So when Kate was born, I was, I mean, if you would have had Sarah of 2010 <laughs> next to this Sarah, you would not know we're the same people. So I, my personality is my personality, but I struggled so much as a new mom. It played right into my Enneagram defaults, which are feelings of worthlessness mm -hmm. and like uselessness. Like you weren't getting anything done. As a, yeah, yeah. But beyond that, I felt like I wasn't seen. Okay. And I just desperately wanted to be seen mm -hmm. as something other than the snot wiper, the vomit cleaner, the diaper wiper. Right. So I am all about, I just started putting myself out there over and over again. Um, Because my personal motto is if I'm not being rejected enough, I'm not being putting myself out there enough. Now that could be painful. Like right. Kim's not going to be into that. But what I would say is I started by, I found a mom's group. And I know that those can kind of go a couple different ways. Yeah. And I'm not friends with everybody in the mom's group, but I found people that I'm still friends with and our kids are eight. I'm going on a 10 years of friendship girls trip in April with my mom's group that I met when I was, yeah, yeah a decade. So find those ladies and be vulnerable with them. Like we went on our, we were at our first uh, meetup and I was trying to assess the situation because you're like, uh oh, what kind of mom are you? Because I'm a mom that lets them eat Cheerios off the ground. But if yeah. you're not, that's going <laughs> to like could be a problem. And then I said, sometimes I don't like being a mom and I'm bored. And I thought, let's see how this works out. <laughs> let's see how that lands. And they're, like, <laughs> and they're like, oh, me too. So it was just nice. And that this group in particular really picked it, really hit it off. And I found that being vulnerable about how I was really feeling about motherhood, how it was the best thing in the entire world and also like the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Um, being vulnerable allowed me to get close to people and build that community of people. I agree. And I also think that if you if you aren't someone who's like a organizer personality type or like a go-getter or an ambitious person in your own mind, I think we all kind of have our own drivers. It really helps to be connected to a variety of people because what you'll find is that somebody in your new little gaggle of friends is, mm -hmm. and you'll get dragged right. along to karaoke night yeah. or you'll get taken mm -hmm. to a play that you, so um, I think it's, I think it's equally important for those who maybe they don't want to be the one to start the entrepreneur chapter in their town, but it, it's great to have friends like that um, because yeah, find you, your Sarah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I've always really benefited from being around people who are sort of like, I don't know, just more uh, larger than life than I am. So um, I think I that's love great. Being people's wing person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love being people's, uh, I don't know, what am I, the straight man, like the details lady? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it, it all. Because I'm like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And then like my friend Raylene will like actually figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. Okay. I have one last question and sure. I've, this is what I'm actually dying to know because I okay. think of you oh, no. as super like we've talked about just energy you have such positive energy and you're so motivated and you do so many things I want to know what quote-unquote chill looks like for Sarah Ooh. R. Bagley like what is I know that you relax sometimes so what is truly relaxing and I don't mean like what I think of as relaxing is someone else takes my mm. kids and then I get to work uninterrupted that's not what I'm talking about I mean truly chill Sarah R. Bagley what does that look like what do you what would you be doing or what would I see if I came across you on a really relaxed chill day oh my gosh I'm having trouble thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> then I need to add a resolution for you to chill out more in 2018 hmm. um let me think because I was gonna say like teaching group fitness <laughs> <laughs> well yeah you're I mean your soul is fed by the work that you do for sure and it I is, think that's what is. makes this conversation so interesting um, but, but I also think sometimes you have your feet up on the couch right Oh, yes, for sure. Okay. So um, I also see this is this also feeds into lots of things. Lots of things we've talked about. I have trouble getting still mm -hmm. because then that means I have to um, acknowledge things mm -hmm. that I'm thinking. And sometimes I don't want to do that. But um, what I do really enjoy doing, I really love to read. Mm -hmm. So I'll get my kids on iPad and I'm like, no shame. 
screen time because nice. I can't be with them all the live long day. <laughs> I mean, just no. So I love to read uh, and I, I really love to learn. Like if I could be a professional student, that'd be awesome. Yeah. And I love reading. So I like to bust through lots and lots of books. So I absolutely like after we're done with the show, I'll probably like eat my lunch on the couch, reading a book and turn my fireplace on. And I have all these like great Costco blankets. Oh, nice. Like, okay. That, that painted the picture for me. <laughs> okay. I can see okay. Sarah, our bag with okay. chilling now that yeah. works. Yeah. Um, I love to watch. I mean, Dan, and I love to watch TV. I mean, every evening we're down on the couch. Yes. That's us watching too. TV. I'm like trying to get them to rub my feet. That kind of thing. <laughs> No, that chi- that totally counts for me. Um, okay. Evening TV is definitely my top oh, yeah. chill activity. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And we recently got into basketball, like because we, we both went to UEA, and okay. UEA basketball is like ranked number nine. And I'm like super into it, Sarah. It's fun. Like, who did this come from? Like I didn't care about basketball, and now I'm like, when are they on? When no, I have- I can relate. Not from college basketball, but we are a big sports family. So I think sports can draw families together and be really. It's just a diversion in the true literal sense of the word. It is a diversion from life so, yeah. so I'm totally um, chilling okay well things. that's that's a good um that's a good way to wrap up so I want you to tell everybody where to find you let's talk again just just name them off your the names of your podcasts sure. and also where to follow you on Instagram and Facebook and anywhere else sure so you can find me online at Sarah R Bagley B-A-G-L-E-Y dot com okay and my podcast is the Sarah R Bagley podcast and 25% friends and on Instagram I'm Sarah R Bagley and basically the only like I'm not the only Sarah Bagley but I'm the only Sarah R Bagley so if you search for that you'll find me let's have a moment for all Sarah's out there who you know have relatively common last names and can't just get their handle to save their life at least you have a I don't even think I'm I'm the only Sarah Jane Powers. I think there's probably a million of those, too. There is like a Sarah Bagley. Like Bagley's my married name. There's a Sarah Bagley who is some sort of like super awesome, like pioneer woman or something. Because when I Googled Sarah Bagley, I was like, wait, who is this person? So anyway, Um, I'm not that Sarah Bagley. Nope, but you are Sarah R. Bagley.com. And at your website, the podcasts both live there as well, as well as your blog. So that's probably a good place. All of this will be in the show notes, which are always at themomhour.com. This was part of our Voices interview series. It was number 21, the first of the new year. And Sarah, this was so much fun. I have to tell our listeners, you and I both have three kids home right now, and we completed a podcast interview. And two puppies. Yes, and two dogs. With six children and two dogs who did not interrupt us. So... Um, all hail the iPads and yeah. And it was a delicate operation. It was, I feel like, I feel like we need some kind of like an award. I know. Um, Anyway, this has been really fun and, um, listeners go check out Sarah's podcasts and her Instagram and just get a dose of the Sarah R. Bagley energy every day. I feel like you bring such positivity and energy and motivation, um, to all of us. So thank you, Sarah, for being on the show. Thank you. It was my pleasure. 